Welcome to the Dr. Leadership Podcast, where the DR stands for Driving Results. Our focus is weekly conversations around life and business relationships and the important leadership qualities for both. These concepts and qualities will help you drive positive results in both your business and personal lives. A weekly connection point to help business leaders develop individual contributors, managers, and executives on your teams. We also will tie in concepts around family focus and life lessons to help you drive success in your personal life. Welcome to the Dr. Leadership Show. Let's get after it. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Dr. Leadership Podcast. The doctor is in. Hey, I hope everyone's having a great day. It's a uh, another week in the books, as I say, every week in the books. And uh, today, I want to take uh, a little d- different direction. Uh, I've been talking about goals, goal setting, uh, humor, uh, some different things on how to accomplish goals, questions to ponder on how to be your best you uh, over the last couple of weeks. And I really want to go into um, a little bit more on the community side. It, it plays in with work as well, but um, this one's a little more personal, community-focused on how to be a community leader. Um, this month, we've loaded up on the subscription site uh, a wonderful interview with a young lady by the name of Brenna Finnerty. I talked about a, a, pr- a prior podcast before we got the interview done. Uh, COVID kind of interrupted our schedule, et cetera. But um, got her in for a really nice conversation. And Brenna's um, in a, a account executive position now in the uh, in the seller's world and, and customer service type world, but spent a uh, over a decade actually leading philanthropic approaches for a large hospital network in the Midwest, Unity Point Health, and um, did a just a wonderful job on community giving, uh, having some significant impacts on people, raising a lot of money, And what I want to kind of do is kind of set up her conversation that people can check out uh, via our website at www.drleadershipresults.com and talk about the importance of community giving and gifting and helping others. It's it's really about, uh, in this great big world, it's not what you have, it's what you give. And people can give in a number of different ways, right? What this is really all about is to build a better village. And we we need to understand that when I say giving, there's personal benefits that come from that too. I think that everyone should look at their life as um, all the fortunate things, right? Look at the glass half full, look at the positive things in your life, and understand that things could always be worse. Now, if you're struggling with challenges and problems, you may also be the beneficiary of some of these helps. Uh, helpful engagements and these organizations that help and people uh, jump in to give you support in those time of needs. So it's good to give because someday you may need on the, uh, may need to be on the other side of that. And I think that in today's society, I've said it many times before, it's very me, me, me focused in everything we see in this world today. Agree with me, look at me, it's all about me. And we need to change the the lens. We need to change where the light is going onto the we and onto others, onto the village holistically, etc. And the good thing about giving, and I will touch on the three T's of giving, right? It can be time, it can be talent, and it can be treasure. So when I say giving, it isn't necessarily you need to write checks. That's a very important part of it. I'll talk in that in greater detail here in a few minutes. But the three T's allow you to give in a number of different ways. But the thing that comes back to you from giving are some great things as well. You know, volunteering, as an example, let's talk about time, introduce you to a lot and connect you to a lot of others. That can be good for your business life. It's good for your mental health. It expands your social skills, right? Because all different types of... When you're at work, a lot of those people are in the same type of uh, mindset you are, right? What you're working uh, on and with are very centric to each other. When you go out and you volunteer and you give to something that you don't interact with every day, you're going to get all sorts of different experiences, different types of people to interact with. It's great for that. It helps the village too, right? Volunteering connects you to others. It gets you ingrained in your local community, be it a town, a suburb, a state, Whatever it might be, those people that are giving around you are going to interact as well. 
it's also really good for your mind and body. Giving increases your self-confidence. It increases your self-esteem. You feel much better about yourself. You feel like you're driving a sense, or, or you are driving a sense of accomplishment. If you go and help out the Habitat for Humanity, as an example, and you're sitting there and hammering nails, carrying boards, shingling houses, first of all, you're learning maybe a skill that could be valuable to you later in life, fixing your own things at home so you don't have to spend that money. But it also allows you to see uh, what you're creating when you're done. Habitat uh, for Humanity is a really good one because you're building a home for somebody or you're fixing a home for somebody. You may just be painting it for someone elderly, has a, a mishap in life, and um, the person that normally handles that in the family can no longer do that because of their health and wellness. So self-esteem, your confidence, that feeling of accomplishment. The other thing it does, it combats depression. It will make you happier when you sit back and you think about yourself and say, man, I did something good for the community today. It helps with your physical health. I mean, bending over, picking up boards, moving around, helping, uh, doing walkathons, doing whatever it might be, door-to-door -door, uh, collections, whether it be for uh, a sickness, an illness, a disease, uh, building homes through Habitat for Your Humanity, being on a YMCA board, whatever it might be, those things are going to be good for your body and mind and your, your actual physical health as well. So as I said, there's uh, Brenna turned me on to this in our interview with her for the Leadership Lounge, she said there's really three T's of uh, helping others and uh, community giving. And as I said a minute ago, it's time, talent, and treasure. And when you're younger, you don't have a lot of treasure. When you're middle-aged and even older, maybe you don't have a lot of treasure. But there's still two T's that you can give there. You can give your time and you can give your talent. You don't have to give a bunch of money, even when it's talking about treasure. Small gifts matter. These uh, big organizations that are, are raising money for different causes are just as thankful and, and are so happy with a $20 bill versus a, you know, a $2,000 check because they're going to get a lot more 20s than those $2,000 checks. So every dollar counts. Your time is extremely valuable. We understand that, right? Your weekends come too far and, and few and in between, but man, it leads to good feelings, positive vibes, and that wonderful thing we covered for a couple weeks called uh, the power of appreciation. Saying thank you to others is one way, but hearing thank you and having someone look to you and say, you've made a difference in my life. You've made an impact. You've helped me out of a tough situation. Those are wonderful, heartwarming things that create contagion. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to call your buddy, your girlfriend, and say, hey, next month I'm going to help with this cause. Would you like to join me? It was so cool last time. I felt so good. It's invigorated me to even step up more, lean in more. We talk about leaning in a lot. It allows me to come in and make myself feel good and pass those feelings on. We've talked a number of times that there's kind of this cloud over society right now. And we need to uplift and enlighten and bring joy to our communities and start treating each other with the personal respect toward each other. Don't have to agree with you, but we can be neighbors. We can watch out for each other's well-being. We can help those that are less, less fortunate. That doesn't take a political party or a belief system or a religious belief or not belief to be good for the community. Why wouldn't we drive towards that as individuals? The other thing that's great when you do these things is to include your children and your children's friends. It creates a frenzy, right? Giving isn't often what the cool parents think they ought to do with the kids' friends. But instead of trying to you know, go to the latest, hottest movie, instead of going to the latest, hottest restaurant or sporting event, Maybe one out of every five times you say, you know what we're going to do? We're going we're gonna to be trendsetters here and not trend followers. And we're going to go to the food bank. A couple things happen there. One is a feeling of appreciation from your children on what they have because they don't understand many times, and I hope you aren't experiencing this, but the feeling of hunger. There's lots and lots of hungry people in this country and in this world. 
and to empower your kids with the good feelings and the understanding that comes, uh, and, uh, the understanding of helping others that comes from community giving and leaning into your uh, your local your local needs, a philanthropic organization of some sort is going to do wonders. We have to pass on that community expectation, or not expectation, that's a bad word, that community need to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. Churches are actually falling down in the amount that are coming through them through tithing or donations. During the Great Depression, 3.3% of the population gave through their church. Today, it's 2.1%. Now, the population has, you know, more than doubled, so the math, more people net are giving, but as a population, religion and that type of concept or belief mechanism, that centralized location where you go for that type of messaging has decreased. Again, this isn't about you should go to church or shouldn't go to church, just pointing out some of the things that are happening in society today that lead us to need more people to engage different ways. The church used to be more of a central location for giving and tithing to happen. Now today, there's lots of good organizations out there. So we need to pick one. We need to find one that we believe in that has a meaning to us. And then we can engage as much as possible and teach those young ones. Because you send five kids back to the fifth grade on Monday that had a great time helping with a Habitat for Humanity or helping with a cleanup or whatever. You take them out for ice cream afterwards, make it fun at the end, a little reward for the, for the uh, oh, do we got to at the beginning. They go and talk how cool it is. Maybe that touches another kid to say, well, why don't we go do something like that? Kids' hearts are as big as the room. They haven't been tainted by society yet. So utilize that spirit to not only pick yourself up, but to pass on the, uh, the great concepts of giving to others. Back to time. So the first of the T. Again, you don't have to have a lot of money. You don't have to have a lot of talent. But everyone does have time. No one is too busy to look around and go, I'm going to go help someone else. Human nature, deep down inside, we are willing to help. That's why we start conversations when you need something with, hey, can I ask a favor of you? 99 out of 100 times people are going, yeah, what can I do for you? That's what you're doing to others is you're providing favors. So from a time standpoint, there's lots of easy things to give consideration to. Join a local board. Go to Habitat for Humanity, which we talked about. They'll provide the hammer and the nails. Focus to the village. What is near to your heart? Near to my heart is a terrible thing that affects the elderly and, and, and even people with early onset. My father passed away fighting Alzheimer's, severe dementia at the end. It isn't what killed him, but it caused the health breakdown that did, did hurt him. My wife lost her mother at a very young age. My wife was 21, her mother was 46, died of cancer. Those two organizations or those two um, drives or drivers Uh, for financing and needing support to help people that are fighting those two terrible, uh, dreadful diseases is very important to us. That's near to our heart. Again, time can be easy. So maybe the elderly are something that is important to you. And the village needs to listen to their elders. Some people say, well, the old people, they don't have to live with the decisions we're making today. They're, They're too maybe conservative, or they don't handle change well. The other thing the elderly have is a ton of experience. And how you avoid making mistakes is via experience. Maybe instead of thinking that we got it all figured out, we should lean on our elders a little more. Great societies do. Learn from those before you. It's not to say we don't progress in a different uh, manner, become more accepting of certain things. But by listening to our elders and respecting them, I think society has a better chance of continuing on in a really good direction. But from an elderly standpoint, are there anybody in your neighborhood, your grandparents, uncles, cousins, 
other people's grandparents that need their yard mowed, that have some bushes that need trimmed, whose house needs painted. That doesn't take a lot of skill to lean in and help the elderly. I'm in the middle of winter up here in Iowa. Guess what? Help a neighbor remove snow when the snow comes. Maybe they can't afford to have the local person come with their snowplow on the front of the pickup and clean their driveway out and shovel their walk. You noticed last time it never really got cleaned up. Go up, don't even knock on the door. Just go shovel it. Just go snow blow it. The other day we got a nice snow. My neighbors both have snow blowers. They're a little bit older than me. I'm not, uh, I wouldn't consider myself elderly. I'm in the prime of my life. I wouldn't consider them elderly either. But I'm walking up the sidewalk, the snowblower's running, I'm just walking behind it. Guess what? I did three more houses. Went up and back, took me two and a half minutes. I felt pretty good about myself. Those little things make a difference. My next door neighbor comes out and shoveling and, and, and starts doing his walk and then fires up his snowblower, sees me still out there, raises his hand. Hey, thanks, I'll get you next time. Man, giving back gives back. Do you have a vehicle? Maybe help with food delivery to people that can't get out. That's another engagement with the elderly society, right? Is you can go and be a leader inside the community by helping those that can't get out and get groceries, deliver groceries, deliver ready-made meals. Mom's Kitchen is a big one here in Des Moines where they deliver food to people that are less capable of getting out and getting meals. Another thing, go to your local retirement community because you know what elderly people uh, need more of than lots of us that are younger? Rides to doctor's appointments. They see physicians, dentists, eye doctors more often than we do when you're younger. The body isn't falling apart on you yet. Sharp as hell in the mind, but the wheels are starting to wear a little bit in life. Go to your local um, ride share uh, organization. Go to your local retirement community. Ask them, what type of background information do you need on me? I would like to offer rides for doctor's appointments on Saturday. From noon until 3, I'm available uh, every uh, weekend. Or if you're a stay-at-home parent and the kids are off to school, I can do it on Mondays and Thursdays between noon and 2. Weekends, not a lot of doctor's appointments, urgent care, things of that nature. Certain eye doctor um, appointments are open. Maybe a run to the grocery store with them. Insert whatever the ride is to. But a lot of times, elderly people, they call a taxi and they got to drop 20 bucks to get to the, the pharmacy. The, the taxi's waiting for them. The meter's still running. They come out and cost them 25 to get back because the wait time, that $45 means a lot to somebody on a fixed income. So your time can be given in a lot of different manners, right? It takes no talent to give time. The next is talent. How can I use my talents to help others? Well, Habitat for Humanity, if you know some things about construction, that'd be great. If you've got tools, that'd be great. But maybe you're an accountant. Very important job coming up in a tax season here. Maybe off your ser offer your services, go into the retirement community and say, uh, I'll tell you what, I'd like to offer my services for 10 people's taxes this year. There'll be no charge. I'd be happy to do them for you and then I'll drop them back off at the retirement community. Maybe you go to the church and say, do you have some low-income people or some um, immigration, some people that have come through immigration and uh, have not yet got um, their self-established but do have income coming in, a Social Security number's been given, so they need to file taxes. You know, H&R Block locally is a great way to do it. TurboTax is a great way to do it, but all that costs money. To handle a simple uh, person's taxes the simple forms that are out there, an accountant can enter those numbers very quickly. And if you are one, look into that. That's a give of a, of a talent. Maybe you're a dentist or a doctor. A dentist can offer free cleanings. What a great thing. You do have to pay your staff for that, your hygienist. But how long does a dentist appointment take? 45 minutes? If you've got a five-chair dental office or a four-chair dental office, you have millions of dollars coming into the, into the door every year. What skin off your back financially, first of all, you would be able to give treasure to, but from a talent standpoint, does it, does it cost you to give one free cleaning a day 
out of those five chairs. Each five chair does six a day. There's 30, you're given one. It's a 3% impact on your labor cost. You can write it off. There are benefits there too. I want you to do it for the heart benefits, not the wallet benefits, but there's ways to which to share your talent. We talked about food drives and dropping off food. If you're a cook, you own a restaurant, what are you doing with your leftovers? What are you doing when you prepare meals that aren't right? What are you doing at church on Sunday when you have a potluck and you brought it in for everybody, the breakfast or the lasagna that was made, and you got three extra, uh, extra pans of lasagna? Take them to the local shelter. They will be much appreciated. Give your time. Give your talent. There's lots of other talents out there that you can do. If you're a landscaping company, take care of the retirement community for nothing. Take care of anybody that needs help doing it. You drive down the neighborhood, you see a house that's really struggling with it, an older person you know lives there, stop by and say, hey, we'd like to take care of your yard for you, no charge. Do you mind if we go ahead and take care of this? It will make you feel wonderful. Let's talk about treasure here for a little bit, and this one's going to take a little bit longer. It doesn't take a lot of money to make a difference. We were very actively involved with the shelter, uh, the men's and women's shelter down in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, uh, Union County, actually, outside of um, uh, uh, Monroe. I say Monroe, but Monroe, uh, uh, North Carolina, uh, Union County Men's Shelter. We used to take the kids, and every fourth Thursday, we would fill the food bank pantry up. We'd go get $150 worth of groceries. We were fortunate enough to be able to do something like that. $150 $150 spent on the right things fills a pantry with hundreds of meals. We would do that every fourth Thursday. Then every fourth Sunday, we would go down with our two daughters, and they were at the age of uh, you know, 13 and 10, 14 and 11, 15 and 12, and we would go and we would serve the meals. Someone else would start it up. Uh, a, a church group would come in and do breakfast. They would put the meals in the oven for us. We'd come pull out of the ovens, cut the lasagna up, uh, serve up the pasta, uh, uh, figure out the, the fruit cups, get all that put together, and we'd serve 50 or 60 meals in there. My kids' hearts were so full. It makes them understand how fortunate we all are. We are all one bad thing away from being on the other side of that counter getting served a meal. It makes you feel so good inside. But it doesn't take a lot of big investment there. The churches would give some meals, the leftovers, those types of things. We would do a little bit of filling the pantry up. But that business was um, financed on $10 donations. It doesn't take millions and millions of giving to do that. A couple of stats here for you. I do a little bit of investigation before I come down here and start yapping my my mouth to see you know, if, if what I'm thinking is accurate. I want to give some some good data points. But the giving two years ago in the United States to philanthropic organizations through churches, private giving, etc., giving corporate and personal $389 billion. Now, that's a lot of money, and we still have a lot of people in need. So it's important for everybody to put a couple shillings in when they can afford it. That same year, churches of the 389 billion were 78 billion. That's a lot of money. Now the key I would say in giving, first of all, if you're involved in a church and you give through uh, religiously for that, you need to understand that a um, larger portion 50%, 60% goes to the administrative needs of the church. The churches are financed through giving. Many people in today's world see some of these large churches, and not every church is perfect. Not every pastor has been perfect. Not every nun has been perfect. I understand that. I don't want to get down the road of let's talk about if they're good or bad, because the very vast majority of churchgoers and churches are delivering great things into the community. 
The reason I want to touch on that for a minute is if you would, people many times complain and say they need to be taxable. Churches need to be taxed. They're giving these big paychecks to pastors. I don't like that either. But what happens is when you tax a philanthropic or a giving organization, if you put them out of the 501c business, 501c is a corporate type that is nonprofit that doesn't pay income taxes. Once you do that, the giving to that organization will be dramatically diminished. It's not because the taxes will come out before the giving reaches the street. The reason is, is that the value of the dollar, uh, the cost of the dollar that each individual is giving goes up. So if I go to give $100 to the church and if I can itemize on my taxes, I can write that off. So I take $100 off my tax, um, off my income, and let's say between state and federal tax, it's 35% that I'm paying. Then I just uh, was able to earn $100 gross and pass on $100 gross. If it was taxed, if those churches were not a write offable event for me, I still would only be able to give the net of that $100 that I can afford to give. So what I would now pass to the church is $65 instead of $100. Churches do a very good job on feeding, helping the homeless, giving uh, counseling to abused spousal situations. There's tons of good there. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. If you put them out of the tax, uh, tax-free business, pull them off of the 501c, $78 billion went through churches last year. Let's say half of that gets to the community, and that's about what it is. So you got $39 billion that will then be cut by 40%. That's $16 billion off of there. You lose $16 billion because you're mad about something that one pastor did somewhere, and suddenly the community suffers. So we just need to proceed with caution there. I'm not saying that there isn't value in some of the statements around that. It's not about a political uh, statement here. It's not about a religious statement. We just need to understand that how we are feeding the hungry, how we are housing the poor, is many times through religious-based organizations and their taxation position helps drive more dollars into the community. That is good for the village. So back to this billions of dollars. When you give, the power of your dollars are increased because of that 501c structure. Whether it's the Boys and Girls Club, whether it's through a church, whether it's through Habitat Through Humanity, whether it's through food banks, women's shelters, pick whatever you want. Don't give through the churches, then give through other organizations. The key to look for outside of churches, because churches have higher administrative expenses because they've got physical buildings, they've got staff, they've got insurance, they've got heat, electric, all those types of things. So their uh, expense ratio is a little bit higher. But when you're looking outside of religious organizations to give, look for ones that have a very low administrative expense over the top of them. This goes back to the time and talent portion of the three T's These food banks, many times an accountant is offering to do the books for that food bank for no charge. They don't have to spend administrative dollars on their accounting structures and on their accounting needs. You may have a person that is a business leader in the community and agrees to run and be the president of the board. She says, I'll be the president of the board for the West Des Moines Food Bank this year. That's a giving of time and talent. No administrative expense then. There are organizations, food banks are one of them, that give up to that up to 99.9% of every dollar they receive goes to those in need. Typically, we say anything over 85% of net value to the needy is a good organization in which to participate with. Because you want low administrative expenses, so as many dollars as possible that they receive aren't going to salaries and insurance for their employees, but are going to the hungry, going to the homeless, going to the drug addicted, going to the abused, going to those needing psychological help, going to those that are looking for marriage support to keep the family together, those that have um, needs for their children, be it special needs inside uh, curriculum, 
and locations for them to go to school. All of these things take dollar upon dollar upon dollar. So when you're looking in the mirror in the morning and you look at yourself and you go, I got life great, try to, in the back of your mind, remember that there are people that don't get a look in the mirror and feel that way. What are you doing today to make a difference in someone else's life? Nothing feels better than helping others. I promise you. And it becomes habit forming. It becomes like good things pumping through your blood system. And you don't do it just for your own good feelings, but that's a big benefit. That's the, that's the icing and the cherry on top of that wonderful thing you're doing. It allows you to feel better. Remember, it drives better health for yourself. Remember, it makes people uh, healthier. It helps them get over anxiety, raises depression out of people, takes depression out of people. There's lots of ways to do it. Another way to even impact more through a tax advantage to help others is if you don't know it, remember we talked about financial leadership being a good leader in your family here four or five episodes ago. You need to be investing in the market, buying stocks, buying mutual funds, etc. One thing that happens, if it's not in your 401k, a deferred tax program, but you're just sending to a local investor or you're buying stocks in your E-Trade or Scott Trade account, one thing you can do is when you buy stocks and they raise in price, you have gains. And after a year, uh, taxation goes down, but you can have short-term gains and long-term gains. No matter what, Uncle Sam, the tax man, is going to cometh on those gains. But if you transfer shares with gains to a 501c, a nonprofit, you don't have to pay the gains on that, and you get a write-off the whole value, including the gains, as a tax advantage for you individually. You gain some benefit there, but also the gains are now going to the whatever the 501c is you're giving to. Boys and Girls Club, Junior Achievement, um, uh, the food banks, whatever it might be. Get to know how these programs can be impacted. Get to understand how the financial world works because it not only benefits you personally, but then it allows you to benefit other people in need more efficiently, higher, higher dollar amounts. Today's talk isn't a tax guidance meeting. It isn't about church or not church. It's about removing ourselves as the most important thing in the center of our little universe. It's about looking to others and seeing how we can bring the village closer together. It's about understanding and being thankful. It's about being appreciative. It's about being a leader and showing others that other people are more important than just all about we, we, uh, about me, me, me. Get it to the we, we, we. Mentally, it is going to do great things for you. It's going to energize you. It's going to make you feel happy. It's going to make you feel thankful. And it's also going to allow you to continue to be awesome so you can keep that shit up. Talk next week.